kinds of things. We must be careful, careful. Tell him that I, that, that I, I didn't come to make his job more difficult. But race can only be defined as a human being. We underestimate ourselves, and that is, I'm, I'm pretty smart. <laughs> Yeah, I work pretty hard. Um, I'm, I'm good at what I do. What I do. And I feel that if we're going to talk about to the total liberation of black people, we first have to liberate ourselves from the material conditions of our humanity. Any life and every life is enhanced by the sharing and the giving and the opening up of the heart space. What is fundamentally beautiful is compassion for yourself and for those who know those You chose hope and unity, decency, science, and yes, yes truth. truth. And I think I stayed with science fiction because the freedom that it allowed was just so great. Uh, there was no subject that I couldn't discuss. I know this Cali girl. But she's so New York, tattoos on her hand. She says it didn't hurt. She had a no hurry. Walking without worries. Downtown's hella busy. Traffic got me dizzy. We all want so much and haven't last real long. Still pretend we're missing things we've been wishing for. Wishing for make my own praise. Wow, 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 wow. Hello, everyone. My name is Charles Reese, and I'm going to be serving as your host and guide for this evening's Jackie Robinson Arts and Humanity Lecture Series, the virtual remote. Online edition 2021. So listen, everyone, we've had some music, we've had some poetry. And so we're just gonna go ahead on and move into our featured phenomenal black woman for this evening. Um, she's a curator. I wanna start with that word. She's an author, she's an educator, She's an administrator and public advocate for reimagining the role of art museums in society. She's a native of San Francisco. She earned her BA in art history from Sonoma State University and received her MA in art history from Howard University. Since January, 2020, she is, and I like to say that, she is the director and chief executive officer of the new Lucas Museum of Narrative Art. Now, she oversees all curatorial, educational, public, and operational affairs for the fast developing institution, including the realization of a 300,000 square foot building. I'm gonna say that one more time. 300,000 square foot building currently under construction in Los Angeles Exposition Park. And it's gonna have an integrated park that's gonna have 11 acres of new park. Everybody in LA, we love parks. Ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls, please welcome the phenomenal <laughs> Miss Sandra Jackson Dumont. Hey there. Hello. Thank you so much, I, Charles. That was too, way too generous. Oh, no, to what? no, it's not. <laughs> 300,000 square feet. Come on now. <laughs> just a little something that we're just working on on the side. So I'm so glad you're here. Um, I want to dive right in because I know people have been waiting for you and I want to just have this conversation so I can really open up some questions so I can let people in because I know they want to hear that. But I want to jump into um, some of your earlier life, uh, th those California years to Washington, D.C., to Howard University. Um, how did 
museum world play in your life as a young child? Oh, I, I, as a young child, first of all, I should, you know, acknowledge that we are, I'm speaking you, to you from the land of the Tongva people, which are indigenous people of this, this space. Um, and so I feel grateful that they have been custodians of this land and that we get to inhabit this space alongside them. Um, I would, um, how did I, I didn't like museums growing up. I wasn't someone who grew up um, going to museums for fun. They were class assignments and things like that. I don't really have that much of a memory of how museums made me feel great as a child. Um, and so how I came to them um, is, is, is really interesting and odd. It, I was like someone who watched TV as a kid. I know all these folks in the world don't watch TV, but you know, I did as a <laughs> child. Um, and so I saw a special um, when I was a kid, when I was in high school or college, and um, I don't even remember, but I, I saw a special on, um, on the Studio Museum in Harlem, which is a place that I ended up working and loving. Okay. Um, and, um, and, and I also uh, came to art museums uh, because um, I also learned about how to, how to be in the world through talking with people who they themselves went to art museums. So that was interesting to me. Um, so San Francisco was a place where I went to museums and we tore stuff up. Like I feel bad about what I did in Golden Gate Park, squeezing sea anemones in, in the Natural History Museum or running around the museum there. Um, but I didn't grow up going to museum in the same way. I also fell in love as a child in an interesting way, not as a child, but as a college student. Um, uh, maybe it was like late high school. I, don't, I can't even remember. When did um, um, Boomerang come out? Um, uh, 90s. 90s. Yeah, so I was in. Ish. I must say maybe 95-ish. Maybe I might be a little off. <laughs> Maybe I think bit. that might be a little late. It had yeah. to be um, earlier than that. But, um, okay, about 90, 92, 93-ish. 90, 92, 93, something like that. Yeah. Anyway, I saw it, and, um, and Halle Berry was this amazing person who worked um, at an agency, an ad agency, um, and she went to museums, and she also was, she, she volunteered in the community and stuff like that. And so those two things really did influence how I saw um, people in the arts, um, being able to be fly, be interesting, and also be critical community engagement people, but also be intellectually rigorous. And so all those things could come together when I think I understood museums earlier to be a place where you actually, that went to be around those people's stuff. Um, and I just, uh, I, those, those two spaces helped me understand it differently. Those two ways of, of those, those two popular culture images helped me understand them differently. Wow. We, we got our dates for Boomerang, 1992. This, <laughs> someone popped it in. I love when, yeah. you know, you have all types of people in, in, in Zoom. That's why I love when I say, put it out there, let's get it back. Um, oh, yeah. I want to share something, uh, a little clip um, that kind of okay. sort of talks about the 12 year old Sandra, kind of sort of her experience dealing with church rhythm and kind of sort of connects back to the museum and then we'll come right back. I'm gonna let my tech team show this little small clip from one of your TED Talks. When I was 12 years old, I prayed for rhythm. I know that sounds funny, but it's true. It's a very true story. I grew up going to a host of churches when I was a kid. The music was very different at every church. In the mornings, I went to a Baptist church and the music kind of, you clap like this. And in the afternoons, I went to an African Methodist Episcopal church with my godfather. Um, and you learned about African history and you learned about the history and roots of black religiosity, et cetera, et cetera. You kind of didn't really clap, you kind of swayed because you sang hymns. And then in the evenings, I went to Church of God in Christ, also known as Pentecostal Church or Holiness Church, which had a full on band. So there was bass, there was drums, there was the organ and the organ was like, dun, 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 dun. Um, and the clapping was totally different. So in the mornings, we clapped like this. And in the afternoon, I could not catch a beat in the evening. In the evening, I just, I could not catch it for whatever reason, no matter what, no matter how much I tried, I couldn't get the beat. 
which was a real challenge for like a little girl growing up in a black neighborhood in a black community whose mother was just like, and you know, the stereotype that every black person has rhythm, but you know, not everyone does, but, um, and so I prayed and I prayed. And so imagine this 12 year old in the pews, just like praying and like clapping, 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 full on, full on concert happening around her. And there I was like, <laughs> trying my best, praying, being persistent. And then one day, one day it happened. I got it. It was as if God had poured an entire bucket of anointed rhythm all over me. I got it. And I went from in the morning doing this to in the evening going like this. And everyone would be dancing and I would be dancing with them. And so it was amazing, this moment in time where I actually prayed for rhythm and I got it. And then I felt complete. I tell you this story for a very specific reason, not to just take you through my childhood or anything like that and my like interest in rhythm. But I tell you because in my work, I see this all the time. There's always one little kid in a room that is praying that no one sees them doing something that they wish they knew how to do. Hmm. I, I thought, I, I, if, I, I'm going to say this to everybody. If you want to see the whole, uh, the whole talk, um, please put that in the chat because you have to see it's it's a lot more that goes with it. But I love the fact that you said I found my rhythm, and now here you are, that twelve year old, running, building, reimagining the whole museum world in your hands. And so you started that in California, then you went to Washington, D.C., and you went to Howard University. Howard University is known as, when you talk about art and culture, you know, they are the Mecca. <laughs> they hold a lot of history there. What happened at Howard that inspired you to keep on moving through your art world? I think what, what's special about Howard is that it's just normal. Yeah. Like, the idea of being able to do is like normalized, you know? It is, you know, just when you think you don't want to get up and go to school, you look out your window and you see all these like, like volumes of black people just walking down the street, going to school. You actually cannot not do. Um, uh, the thing that I think was really powerful about Howard was that there were so many amazing people that had gone there. I mean, you have, particularly the art school, you have James Porter, you know, one of the first black road scholars. You have, you know, Lois Melu Jones who taught there. Yeah. You have, you know, Jeff Donaldson from Afrocobra. Like literally I would walk out of the office and he would be standing in the doorway because he was the dean of the school. Mm. You have, you know, you know, the late great, all of these folks are late greats at this time, but you have, you know, Floyd Coleman, who was like a scholar scholar, mm -hmm. who lo artists love snuggling next to. You have, you know, Raymond Dobard, who wrote about the history of, you know, um, of the Underground Railroad and how the people made their passages through the Underground Railroad looking at quilts and nobody knew mm -hmm. that they were, quilts were maps. Right. And he could pass and he was from New Orleans, but chose specifically to celebrate his blackness. So I think that this was a place also where, you know, the, the band was in the art building. So I was in graduate school. Oh, so, oh, I was so you were having like, a great you know, time. <laughs> yeah, but I was in grad school. So I was totally like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm older than these folks, you know, whatever. But then you be, you, you're being in an art history class and you hear the drum line practicing outside. Yes. It's almost like a musical like like interlude for every art history lesson. And so I think what what I what I guess I'm saying is that um, I think at Howard what was really beautiful was that there was a beautiful built-in network of people. Mm. And I think I started to understand kind of my curatorial practice without under without knowing it early in that time there, which is where I understood I think I, I, I came to be introduced to an ecosystem of practice. Because you have people like David Driscoll, another late, great, incredible art historian, scholar, artist, who said, what someone asked him one day, like, 
well, why did you choose to do all these things? Like, you know, be a, a scholar, to be an artist, to be an administrator. He mm-hmm. said, well, uh, I didn't have a choice at the time. There weren't a lot of people writing about us. There weren't a lot of people giving us opportunities. There weren't, so I needed to do all these things. And so I think Howard became this really interesting space where one understood that they could do many different things and have an integrated life. And that one, for me, that's what I, I, I feel like I learned. And oh, I I'm, felt like I became connected there. Yeah. I mean, being a DC native, I will tell you, I did, I ended up going to Morehouse, but all my studies for the SAT, and I used to go around the corner and listen to the band. I actually lived around the corner from Howard. I lived at 503 mm-hmm. Rhode Island Avenue. So literally, oh, wow. the band, we we had we had to listen to the band as a young child. That was a part of our neighborhood. The band would come marching down our street. So we knew how to yeah. nine to five. And Ooh, it was wow. good being in the band. Band was good for math, by the way. It helped you count. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it really does. Um, yeah. so we 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 come so we moved from California, that young 12-year-old child. Now we the 12-year-old child has gone and got her masters at you following this narrative here. I'm trying to stay with the narrative museum of art. So we we kind of sort of now moving from Washington, DC. I want to just go from your New York years to your LA years so we can finally get to this museum because I know people want to hear about what's going on. So you get to New York. Um, it's not your first museum, um, but I want to talk about Studio Museum of Holland and the Thelma Golden Days. Mm-hmm. <laughs> can you just tell me about that experience? What was that like? Yeah, so the Studio Museum, I actually, um, uh, before I even went, when I was an undergrad, I saw the Studio Museum on that NPR show. And I knew that I wanted to, I wanted a black college experience. I was at a predominantly white college where actually I didn't, she wasn't there when I was there, but Ntisaki Shange taught at the school I went to in undergrad. And so there were like all these amazing roots. Like these were folks that, you know, were, they were, you know, surrounded by hippies, doing all kinds of amazing things in Northern California. While I was there, I was like, wow, I never traveled really anywhere outside of the Bay Area, which is where I'm from. Um, And so I was like, I really want a Black college experience. And so they had this national student exchange program. I didn't think that I could go on an international student exchange. So I didn't even have a, I didn't have a passport. I'd never really been anywhere far. So I went to the East Coast, um, to actually go and get a black college experience um, uh, in many ways. Um, And I didn't get a black college experience. I decided I would go to New York instead um, to get what felt like another country in many ways, because it was so big, it was on the other side of the country. And so Studio Museum became this really interesting place. So I interned there and I got to meet all these incredible people. And that's where I really shifted for me that I should study art history. I was a biology major until my senior oh, really? year. I okay. changed my, yeah, I changed my, um, my, my emphasis to studio and art history. Um, and then I went to graduate school at Howard because I actually thought I really want to, I really want to pursue this. I really want to okay. understand how to, how to, impact thinking. So New York became like an extension of who I was on so many levels. And so I went to New York and worked at the Studio Museum in Harlem because I had met people in undergrad and that network became interesting. So in grad school, I kept going back to New York to do projects and volunteer and do all kinds of things at the studio. And, um, and the Thelma Golden years, there's like a lot of years. So Thelma is amazing yes. and she's incredible. And we did a lot of incredible things together. There's also the Lowry Sims years before that. And before right, that, right, there's right. the Tinshasha home in Conwell. And then there's the management Oh, Kinshasa, Campbell. oh right. Because she's, she's in D.C. now. She's in D.C. And then there's the Mary Schmidt Campbell, who's president of Spelman. And, Spelman and College. she's the director there. So these like this long, beautiful, wow. beautiful lineage of Black women some of which I saw on that show, who I actually got to know and are in my life today. Um, right. Lene Denise, who's the DJ for the night, we, she, she performed at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Um, so this is like a beautiful network of amazing people. So that's, we can talk about those days. Tell, ask me a specific question, because I could just talk all day about No, I, I, I think you do. I just want to just to clarify, we, we, there were so many names. When you, th- you, when you start talking names, I started getting excited. Dr. Mary Smith Campbell, she was at NYU for years in the Tisch School. Mm-hmm. And I, used to, I was in the uh, program there, so I used to run to her all the time. And I've seen yeah. her at Spelman. And, she, and you have protégés all over the place. I just, just one quick thing. I just want to identify, because a lot of people may not know who Thelma Golden is. I just want to oh, just sure. give you a snippet of 
Yeah. Out of all those women, I'm just highlighting Thelma for this particular oh, moment yeah. because a lot of you all, and I say a lot of you all, you are here in the uh, in in um, LA. Um, we have another person at LACMA. So there's a series of women. I call the Thelma and Golden women, is what I say. And I, I know you're a mix of all the women that you name, but just highlight Thelma Golden just for a minute because I want people to know that. Yeah. So actually, Thelma, um, I first met Thelma um, when she was at the Whitney, and I worked at the Whitney at the time. Okay. And I met her, I was younger than Thelma, um, and she, she's going to kill me for that, but anyway, yeah, so I was younger than Thelma, and, um, and she, was a, she was a curator who had just worked on a bunch of shows, the Bob Thompson show, the Black Male show, all those things, and so I was a younger person working there. And, um, and, and I know Thelma because uh, she would always come down to the programming department to chat with my then boss, Connie Wolf. And she was just like, who's that girl over there? Who's that black woman? You know, who's that young lady? <laughs> and at the time I was a fellow in the curatorial studies program, um, which was the independent study program, which is a Marxist theory program. Okay. And we had to present our curatorial exhibition ideas. And so she took an interest in me. In fact, she hooked me up with an intern, actually not an internship, a job with the incredible um, um, Lorna Simpson. And so I was Lorna's studio assistant because Thelma was like, she needs help, you need a job. And so she hooked me up. I went to work at the studio museum. Um, Thelma left the Whitney and then I, they recruited me to come over to the studio museum with Thelma and Lowry. So. Uh. Thelma used to be an intern years ago at the studio. So it was really this beautiful kind of like legacy idea of all these people coming back to this launching pad. And so myself, Thelma and Lowry went on this kind of mission of really figuring out how could we make this institution that was incredible um, catalytic and a nexus for black art and culture, but we could bring all of our folks from different parts of the world or different walks of life back into the space. I was very much into DJ culture. Mm -hmm. um, and so I brought for me and I was interested in popular culture and emergence and the convergence of those things with you know, um, under-resourced communities. Um, and I was very much interested in that through the lens of social justice, tying back to the history of how black people had built that space um, and so it became this really awesome place where folks from different generations found themselves dancing in Harlem at midnight <laughs> wow. in the rain to DJs um, to, and looking at art at the same time. Um, and so we produced programs like Uptown Fridays. All of this was about this notion of building a narrative. How do we build a narrative for ourselves and me imagine how we tell our own stories Right. and have them actually be critical friends sitting up against like seriously critical friends that could debunk some of the historical myth that had been told about us and how we think, how we do and how we make. Um, I almost can't tell this story without saying this. I think one of the most interesting things for me um, is how we were, you know, that story about persistence in that present in that TED talk mm -hmm. is the same story of all these artists administrators and cultural producers that have come through the studio museum. Those are stories of persistent persistence. Mm -hmm. um, and this even, you know, Sheree's like poem is a story of persistence, you know, yes. Nyla's songs, like, you know, I'm listening to this and I'm Googling on the side, whether then I'm just looking these folks up and it's like this narrative of persistence is super important. Um, so the Studio Museum in Thelma becomes this place where Blackness not only is just an intellectual um, kind of proposition, but it's also a social and a humanistic and a justice um, kind of proposition. And so I think that this is, that is the function of that space to mm. really truly allow us to carve out a, a, a place for ourselves not have it just be ephemeral, but have it be documented and archived. Right, right. And that is like the imperative impulse of that space. So Thelma is very much tied into that. We're getting a new building in Harlem by a black architect named David Ajay. All it's right. Be black and black. Right. 
you know, that whole perspective narrative thing, someone typed that in. Uh, you got a lot of type ins on that. So go check, we'll check the chats later. But there was a lot of wonderful comments that came in while you were actually talking. Um, so we're at the Studio Museum of Harlem. I'm going to move you to a spot where we, we, we officially, I'm going to do full disclosure. We officially, I'm going to let you know where we officially met in Brooklyn, New York. We actually had lunch at Mike's. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, Great right down the street shop. from Emmanuel oh, Baptist man. Church almost 20 years ago. <laughs> Listen, now, don't date me like that. We, Come well, on. I'm dating myself as well, and I'm pla I'm, okay. look, I'm happy I'm to be here. You, know, I, you, know. <laughs> you look <looking> fabulous. <laughs> I tell you, you do. So I'm going to jump to the Seattle Art Museum because yes. that was, for me, a, a reconnection back to you because yes. I came up doing some Baldwin stuff, and I got to witness your work for the remix. <laughs> that you used oh, on yeah. Friday night. <laughs> so let's talk about the Seattle Museum and how that all come about. Because you left, you were in New York, you go from New York, and now you're in Seattle, Washington. That's a big change. Yeah, you know, it was so interesting moving um, to Seattle. You know, the West Coast, people talk about, oh, you know, you're going back to the West Coast, but the West Coast is a very long, long coast. And so, like the East Coast is, but, you know, Seattle is very different than San Francisco. San Francisco is very different than New York, than, um, than, than Los Angeles. Seattle was an interesting place. One of the things that I loved about Seattle was that you could actually live in the urban core and literally see the hand of the creator from the hood. Like mm, literally yes, you could see Mount can. Rainier from the projects. I mean, it's just amazing, right? The other thing that I loved about Seattle was the commitment to people understanding indigeneity and how mm. people across time and place related to the land. Okay. Um, the other thing, so Seattle Art Museum um, is one museum, three locations. And, um, and so we did a lot of things that are not dissimilar from what I did in New York. They were just special for that place. What you experienced was this project called Remix. And I was very much interested in what could we do to get 18 to 35 year olds engaged in the museum? And what, could we recurate the building? Could we change the notion of a museum and have it be like a mixtape? All things for me go back <laughs> to music and word I have to say. So, um, Lene, Lene is doing this on the mixtape part. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's one of those things. And so we actually just opened the museum and if I could describe it, it became an indoor block party but heavily curated where it was literally, I remember this one time we worked with this artist and we, she did these incredible, she was a, a dancer and she did these incredible performances and she proposed that she, um, we commissioned her to do tiny, I guess it's kind of like the NPR now, like tiny top, whatever that thing yeah, is, the performance. The, the, the so small she did these amazing, concert. yeah, performances. But we also didn't just focus on contemporary artists. We, we focused on contemporary artists, all the artists were living, but we pulled people like Donald Byrd who wasn't dancing anymore. Like I was like, Donald, can you come out of retirement to do some awesome stuff? So Donald, we commissioned his dance company and him to take up Nick Cave sound suits, those beautiful those sound big suits. Those big old sound, wow. And we commissioned his dancers to dance in those sound suits. We put them on buses, we put them on other installations. They like broke through the windows. Uh, so it was really, that institution was about, for me, understanding the potential of curating a city in partnership mm -hmm. with others. That if we do things together, and we'll do this at the Lucas Museum, if we do things together, the rising tide lifts all boats, seriously. And that competition is not the way to go, but collaboration means that we don't have to like give up who we are as individuals, but together we actually make something pretty magical. And so that's what we did in Seattle. That's what we'll do here. Um, yeah, I don't know if that helps. No, that listen, it was the whole story for me. I was like, I was following it. You got to Nick Cave, because I think some of those things came here from you. Now that I'm I'm connecting some dots. You know how you see something at another institution, you go, well, where did they get that idea from? Well, now I'm getting where some things could come from. So listen, so we left Seattle. And I, by the way, I'll send it to you later, but I found a picture of us from those Seattle days. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so let's go, you, 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 you talk about the whole East West. So now you leave Washington State and now you head back to New York. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I get that right. And so you end up at the Met, right? I end up at the Met. Mm -hmm. So tell me about that experience. And then we, that's gonna lead us back to LA finally to get to this space that we want to talk about. What, how oh, okay. was the Met? 
The math is amazing. I, I have to say one of the things that I always, my husband laughs at this, but I'm like, I just, I don't think that I have ever run away from a, a gig. Um, you know, I, I just love wherever I'm at, you know, um, yeah. and that, that is a complicated thing because love is complicated now. So, you know, yes, I'm, just it saying, is. You know um, <laughs> I'm not saying that lightly. And so um, one of the things that I think is interesting is that the Met is, it just celebrated its 150th anniversary. For me, it was incredible to be able to go to this place that I've never wanted to work at and find myself um, kind of almost as this distant lover in some ways. Like I loved working there, mm -hmm. um, but I always, no matter where I work, here, anywhere, I always have to figure out how I maintain a certain level of healthy distance so that, you know, um, uh, what is it Baldwin says, you know, if I, you'll be able to tell me this better, but, um, you know, if we love somebody, you have to tell them the truth, you know what I yes. mean? And so that's exactly <laughs> kind of the space, right? And so this, the, the Met became an interesting place for me when I committed to going into the archive. That's also another thing. I mean, Lene is the crate digger. I'm an archive digger, you know, like I just feel like I need to go in there. Anyway, so there are things that I learned about that place that actually fueled and inspired um, work that was new, but in some ways it felt like resuscitated work. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Okay, So I hear you. for example, like I never knew that there's this very popular exhibition um, called Harlem on my mind that, you know, a very important exhibition about black art and culture um, at the height of the 60s. Um, and it, it got heavily criticized. Artists, black artists protested it. Some of our most okay. well-known artists protested it. Okay. The thing that I think is so compelling is that there are all these pieces of the narrative that no one talked about that were also equally challenging. So for example, like I didn't know that Jacob Lawrence, um, Romare Bearden, um, the first artist to show at the Studio Museum, mm -hmm. um, Tom Lloyd, who actually was a black artist working in light. Really? So the first show at the Studio Museum was about a black artist working using light. Are you um, kidding me? An abstractionist, me? yeah. So all those people spoke at the seat, at the Met on the main stage, which is a 720 something seat theater that I used to oversee. Um, and when they were there, they talked about like these incredible, the state of black art and culture in the world at that time. Okay. While at the same time, you know, this institution was being protested. I didn't know that until I went to work there that um, Nina Simone, I found a picture of, I found a, 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 an invitation or an announcement card of Nina Simone performing at the Met live during what the Harlem on My Mind exhibition. Nobody knows this unless you were there. She performed live at the Met. It was oversold by a little over a hundred people that they had to stack people on the stage. And I did all this research. About, so like, it was amazing to really think like it's, just when you think we are not somewhere, we have been we there, right? And so, and I mean that in the biggest sense of the word. Go ahead, Charles. No, is there a recording of that at all? No. It's, at the time, oh, you, know, I, I, tell you, you know what I would have done I, with that. I know. I, I, was, I, said, I was thinking, I, I, I was, was having like, dreams about that this? one. Yeah. No, that's yeah. why I just wanted to get us like, wow. No, there's no recording of it. Um, unfortunately, at the time, music wasn't being recorded yeah, at the time, yeah, which is yeah. why. However, is a, the, let me say that is there a possibility mm -hmm. that there could be some type of recreation ever? Of I don't work there no more, but yes, um, okay. which is what I was doing, you know. But at the Lucas Museum, we will be doing all <laughs> kinds of interesting things. Transition, um, and so yeah. So the thing I would say is that at the Met, one of the things that was super powerful also was that there was um, we did great things. We were a presenting platform for so many amazing artists across time and place. And um, to be at that institution, um, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about how institutions work. Um, but I also learned about um, how important it is for us to be present in these institutions. 
for mm-hmm. us, broadly speaking, people with interesting ideas, people, and that's what that place is. It's a repository of that great stuff. Like you can go into the Islam- Islamic galleries, like, oh man. And to see someone, to walk from my office and go through the galleries and see someone like bowed down in the galleries praying, mm. like, it's like, wow. And so it was there that I really started thinking about like, what kind of language could we use that really could talk about why museums are important? Um, because all these other places, they were, it's where I was like growing my muscles. And here is where I think I honed a little bit more. Okay, um, okay. And at this place, what was interesting was this notion of, um, I, I really came to this place where I was like, these aren't sanctuaries only because there's so much pain as well. Yes, um, yes. It's the place where you could be safer. I don't believe in safe spaces, but it's a little safer to deal with some really important things, you know, um, together with other people and alone by yourself. The Islamic galleries that the Met were formed after 9-11, when they were built, the people felt like they could come back there and feel safe. And so a museum represents this incredible sense of refuge, but it also represents a place where you can reimagine narrative, where we can represent ourselves through the lens of history. And so it, it you know, talking about LGBT, LGBTQAI, People were like, people, we would have a, 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 an event and people would say things like, you know, why, this is an amazing event. Why, why is this happening here? You know, and mm-hmm, it's not mm-hmm. be like, because a thousand years ago, let's go see this gallery where it's already represented. This is not new. Mm. And so it's just such an interesting opportunity. So the Met was like amazing. I'll say that about everywhere I've worked because they've all been amazing. Someone said sanctuaries are so essential. I was reading that in the chat area. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've, we've been done at the Met, and then after the Met, now you're here at the Lucas Museum. Now, unlike the other experiences, and I'm not speaking for you, but bearing, after I was bearing witness to your story and your narrative, um, you now have a whole different opportunity than the previous institutions, because now, you're working with something that's being built from the ground up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so with all the experiences that you have, I know they all come together. I think all the women spoke about this earlier, about how all the experiences that they pulled together. Now that you're at the Lucas um, and you're reimagining with all these experiences and you're building from the ground up, what is your hope and goal for this institution, specifically in this time of COVID-19, because you arrived in January of 2019, and in three months, everything shut down. Pretty yeah. much. Yeah, I, I arrived in January. I walked into the offices on January 15th and got on a plane to go back to be with my family on March 15th. So that is a very short amount of time. Um, we have been, as a team, some of my staff are on this call who are amazing people. I want to tell I you. I love them all. They are rock stars on Riley. Level, folks. Yes. Um, Maisha, um, Nanette. Um, I, um, what's amazing about this opportunity, and I, I did say over and over, like when people were interviewing me early about this, I was like, you know, it's amazing and not have to retrofit anything. But you know, history is an interesting thing, right? Um, I don't know that there's anything that doesn't have some retrofit connected to it. We're talking about the history of museums. We're talking about one of the most iconic institutions as, a, as an institution type that exists. And so um, our goal is actually right now to really look at how to, I'm excited about this too, how do we actually create a museum that, that learns from all of what's been happening in museums mm-hmm. and kind of builds on that. Okay. Um, I, we are a museum dedicated to the art of storytelling. Uh, we believe that through visual storytelling, museums, ex- you know, the Lucas Museum specifically will expand the role of art museums for society. And then right. we also believe that museums um, inspire thought provoking ideas, that our museum will do that. Um, and we'll, we'll, Build, we'll move beyond geographic boundaries, but pay deep attention and our priority will be what's outside of us, right? In this city, in this area. Um, we believe that our work will radiate um, to connect people to more empathetic spaces. 
But I was talking to someone recently about like, you know, like if I had to say what our moonshot is, our okay. moonshot is that we believe that our, the art of storytelling connects us to shape a more just society. Like when you think about it, stories actually can be, can work on you, they can work for you, they can work with you. And we believe that art has shaped society and we want to unpack that. Um, and so I'm excited about the fact that we are a museum that's being built from the ground up and from its core, our founders really do believe that we should be about the neighborhood. That's not, I don't have to convince anyone of that. We don't have to convince anyone of that. Um, so I'm excited about that. Uh, we'll be a people first organization. Okay. Uh, you know, we believe that objects sit in the world and are of the world. They're not these shiny little things we need to put somewhere only, but they really do need to be cared for because, um, because we believe that these stories need to be told across time and place. Um, and we want to be brave and collaborative. Uh, ah, so love that word collaborative. Someone said collaboration and not competition. Um, uh, ideas and I iconography go 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 just I'm, I'm sharing you some thoughts that the people are saying to you as you're talking because you can't see them that's what I love about this format I get to share with you while you're sharing with me listen I could be here all night with you you know that why this probably should be a two-parter <laughs> but what I want to do is because you, you've taken us from New York to LA and we're at the museum I want to give I have a lot of other questions, but I want to give the people that are in these chat areas a little time to do a few little questions um, so that you can actually hear from them yourselves. And so this is how we're going to do it, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, I should say, I should say just guys. Um, I would like to start, um, first of all, we want to see if we can I get students with raised hands first. I want to make sure the students start. I'm going to be that person today. So if we have students, our team is going to tag you. And we're going to start with about two people first. And then once they let me know who those folk are, we're going to unmute them. They can ask you the question. And then we'll, and we'll take it like that. And then our next segment is, is that we will then go into the chat area, try to pick up some questions. And if time permits, we'll go back and try to do a few more raised hands. If everybody in agreement with you, just raise your hand, snap, snap, snap snap or put a snap in the chat. So um, Dina is my crew person who really keeps me moving and grooving. So once Dina lets me know we're ready with two people with questions, then we will start there. So Dina, can you hear me? I can hear you. There you are. So Dina, do we have a couple of people tagged already that we can start with some questions? Not yet. Not yet. You okay. have a beautiful quote. Okay. Can I can I go ahead and read the quote for me, please? please. We're going to start with the quote that was given since. So we'll start. What's the quote, please? The quote is: Yes, our art presence was historically ignored and marginalized by the established majority galleries venues early. Harlem on my mind was protected because, excuse me as I scroll down. Was, yeah, that scroll can get you, go ahead. You know, it was protected because it was the other. Presenting our story, the major black artists of that time were passed over. It is amazing that in today's current climate, so many are still unaware of that history. You wanna yeah. speak on that a little bit? Yeah, I think it's true. Um, I think that the, you know, Harlem on my mind um, is a very well known story. Like the, for those that don't know it, that it is important to look it up because I think that it really is about artists. It's a long story, but it is really truly one that I think oftentimes is told in one dimension. There's a great scholar who was actually living here in Los Angeles now, Bridget Cook, who's written about this significantly. Um, there's also another book called Mounting Frustration that features like the presence of blackness and, and its protest of different organizations. Um, this is a, an incredible history because there's also this other narrative attached to it, you know, out of Harlem on my mind because it was such a challenge and so many problems happened with it. Um, you know, like the Nina Simone thing, most people don't know about that. And I'm constantly always thinking, what was that like? Did she like cross the picket line? Did she, what did she have on when she went to see the show? There's a picture of her in the galleries. Um, how did this happen? You know, um, 
she must have killed it. I have pictures of her on stage, you know. Um, but if I could just get the audio, I know she probably talked trash a little bit because it was at the <laughs> height. Yes. Yes. It was before she, you know, um, got sick, and then it was so it was at the height of her political, her most political state. Um, and so interesting things kind of came out of that. But not I've only met one person, two people that have heard this that she pre she played there. My friends that are ethnomusicologists. I mean, I'm like I just want to give that away for someone to like write a dissertation on because I haven't been able to yet. Um, but what it did is also something else that most people don't know, and that is. When that kind of um, trauma and challenge happens, you have out of it like a, re a, repay a repaving of a path and, a, and, a, and an embarrassment on many levels. And so out of that came this, this brilliant fellowship, which was actually about, these are my words, the development of a public intellectual, someone who cared deeply about scholarship, but mm -hmm. also was public facing. And so people like Marta Vega, Linda Goodbright, Martha Vega, founded the Caribbean Cultural Center in New York City. Amazing, amazing scholar. She was one of these fellows. Um, Linda Goodbryant, who founded <clears throat> Just Above Midtown. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Who right, who's doing work around food justice now. I mean, she just keeps reinventing herself. Linda Goodbryant was a fellow. Was a fellow. Um, you know, there's just amazing people like that. Right, um, right. Out of that came the community arts program, which Laurie Stokes Sims ends up becoming, you know, like one of the first curators at the Met, the only black curator of uh, like literally up until about two years ago. Two years ago, right. Um, I remember in reading the history that. of the Met, you know. And yeah. so, you know, it's such an interesting thing that we actually need to learn how to connect those stories. And so you're right, you know, Arlene Turner Crawford that more people, it's a shame that more people don't understand that story, but it's mm. almost not just that story. It's the long tail of that story. Like the impact of that kind of engagement that I think is super important. And you can see these stories across the world. Right. I mean, right. literally. So I love that. That's a great point. Yeah, and thank you for expounding on that. Okay, guys, we're gonna keep this uh, Q&A open for a couple more minutes. I don't, we don't see a lot for raising hands, so we're gonna keep moving on. But I see a question here that I, that's gonna bring us back to the museum. It says, will you be there having, will you be there, oh, oh it just moved, <laughs> having events? I access two questions now. Hold on one second, I now have to do my little magic and roll that back down. <laughs> So let me see if I can get that back. Ah, that's the marginalized question. It's very interesting. Okay, while I find this question, uh, and I I'll come right back it. to you. You can see if it, can you, you see it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You see it? It says, what? Um, uh, will you be having you events go. and how do you specifically envision these events unfolding at the George Lucas Museum? How will the Lucas Museum curate the narrative art, curate the narrative art of the community? So, um, yes. So let me just take two seconds to tell you about this amazing space. Great. One is that um, the space, it, it's an incredible building. And um, so the building is actually about 600,000 square feet. So you will feel the presence of this facility. The, the usable square footage where we all can be is about 300,000 square feet. The fourth floor, on the first floor of the building, there is two theaters, um, that hold about, they hold 199 people each, a cafe where y'all can come and grab a bite to eat, um, a huge, beautiful, um, two, two lobbies, learning spaces, and then when you go up, and there's, a, there's a gallery, a 10,000 square foot gallery on that floor. On the fourth floor, it's 80,000 square feet. A football field is about 50,000 square feet. This one floor of the museum is 80,000 square feet. And one it's all floor? exhibition space is one giant open space. Wow. Um, and then you go to the fifth floor, there's additional galleries, and then there's a special event space, and then there is um, there's um, and then you go upstairs, or you go, you can go on top of the building, folks. Okay. And so what I imagine is programming across this entire place. I mean, like, imagine intimate, intimate, intimate performances in the nook on the, in the landscape. 
I mm. forgot to mention there's a big, beautiful, a, 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 a big, beautiful window that faces in to the museum on um, on one side that that is that that um, is a view into a library, which we're calling the stacks, um, and it's it's incredible. So, what I'm saying is that um, to answer your question about are we having events? Yes. What they look like, they will be they will range in experience. They will be small and intimate. They will be some bigger. Some of the spaces on the grounds hold, you know, 2,000 people. Some of the spaces are very, very intimate. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so they will range from talks and performances to courses to um, silent films to, you know, this museum will hold the, everything from Carrie James Marshall and Yinka Shonabare to, you know, NCYF and, you know, Flemish paintings. I mean, it is literally the history of narrative art stretches across time and place. Um, and so um, anyway, hopefully that's. Enough. No, that, 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 I think that, 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 did, <laughs> that did a good one because everyone's here is Lucas and they just think it's just about Star Wars <laughs> and it's beyond that. So I'm glad to hear that. I see one hand, I'm going to do, we're going to just get this last question. I see Braden Hollis has a hand up. It's been up for a little bit. Let's get this question in and then we're going to wrap up after this. Um, okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, can everyone hear me? I just had yeah. a question. Is, is the museum, um, how are you all going to be engaging with like uh, contemporary artist in LA. Is that like a priority for the museum? I'm just curious. Oh, yes. Um, living artists are definitely a priority. Um, uh, thank you so much, Braden, for that question. It's a really great question. Um, we actually have, um, we, we one are going to collect artist work. Um, there are some artists that are in Los Angeles that we've already collected their work. Um, one artist that I would love to just throw a little shout out here is the incredible Judy Baca. The museum has the Judy Baca archive. Um, and uh, so that's one artist. Um, uh, there's um, Kadir Nelson. We have like a large holding of Kadir Nelson's work. There's a lot of artists in Los Angeles that we've already collected. Um, we actually want to partner with different kinds of creatives in many ways. Um, one of the things that the team did that might be unexpected and maybe not unexpected, when we had, uh, right when COVID hit, we were trying to figure out how we couldn't just be another place, like, let's just do an online program. That was just being taken care of by so many amazing institutions that we didn't know that we needed to be just a, be another group occupying that space. And so our team really thought about like what what did what were we hearing was needed, um, mm -hmm. and um, and what we heard at the time was nobody had masks. Do you guys remember that? Seems like a distant memory. Remember those mm -hmm. days where people didn't couldn't get masks. You know, like elders at centers. You know, some of the. Because they were all people just so people were on the mask making frenzy. That right, seems right, right. so long ago, right? Because we have designer masks now. Like I think Louis Vuitton got masks now. You know what I mean? It's like it's a whole world. So we actually found out that there were all these artists who normally would have been sewing and working, and their parents were seamstresses, and they came from a tradition of making, and um, and so we gave them resources to make masks and then gave them resources for themselves. And they were so excited. And the team actually found um, organizations in, in vicinity in South LA and we delivered all these masks to these places. So I know, you know, there's this equal part known visual artists and visual right. artists that we're gonna be working with, performing artists, et cetera, but illustrators, et cetera. But we also wanna work with those, with folks that haven't historically been elevated. One mm -hmm. of the goals of the Lucas Museum is to actually right size this, you know, high low thing. Um, right. Because the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, you're low until someone says you're high. And we want to be the place that does all of that and really redefines um, what the canon of art history is. Um, mm -hmm. Because that's what we need to do. These are some quick things I'm going to read from a chat. This is some thoughts that I see. I finally got my chat to work. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, it's so important as this phenomenal space is created and curated 
um, so that local artists, whether known or not, don't end up feeling like foreigners. Just throwing that thought. That's a powerful thought. Um, this comes in and says, I hope Michael, these are just some names that are being thrown out as artists for you. Mm -hmm. I hope Michael Massingbird is on that list. Um, what about the legacy of John Outerbridge? Oh, come on now. Yeah. Yes. You know, um, somebody said, that's great to hear. Thank you, Sandra and Charles. <laughs> I just reading them all. You must have said something that was really great that I missed. And thank you for make, oh, thank you for making a space where we belong. That's Man, you. listen, we are going to make this space. We, right. we, we, we make space, you know. Um, and I think what's really important to say about this is, um, you know, how do we make this as a, how do we make going to museums and cultural institutions overall as commonplace as going to the park, as commonplace as going to a movie? Um, how do we make this, how do we claim these spaces as iconic institutions and places that we actually occupy and own, that we don't, we're not invited to, we're not welcome to, they just are our places. And I think that that is, um, that's so interesting. I was just talking to one of my colleagues earlier, Germanique um, Ulmer, who works on our social impact area. And she said, um, we were talking about a talk she's getting ready to do um, and, you know, she was saying, yeah, I was talking to someone, they were saying, you know, are you going to be welcoming to the people to the museum? And I was like, yeah, we are. But that's like, that's so basic. You know what I mean? Like wait, welcoming people to the museum um, because it's not our museum, ours. It's our museum. And I, that may sound a little kumbaya, but I really truly feel like um, this is the congregation. The mm. museum, I'm going to tell you this tiny little story as we end, because I think it's so incredible. This building um, is a, it's, in, it's an incredible building. It's, it's a building that's kind of floating in, um, it's not a bathtub, but it is a tub. So seismically, if something happens, the building moves. Um, it reminds me of that song, if I move, we move just like that. Like that's what's happening in this building, right? Um, I love that Linnea is getting all my references, but you know, so um, so the the move, the building will move, and it's it's amazing, and it's George Lucas, it's also Melody Hobson, she's our co-founder, right? And so like this idea of where community and art kind of come together. So this building, when I first came, the building was being talked about in a specific way, which is awesome on so many levels and it's like this imagined like floating kind of thing then i spoke to the architect um a guy named ma young song and he um he was i said you know we really want this to be a cultural commons i really we really truly want this to be a place where people come and have discourse where people get uncomfortable but they also can be happy and, and excited and exchange but it really is about like how do we how do we dialogue around issues and ideas that are meaningful to us as individuals that connect to what's in this building. And um, I said, but I'm imagining kind of like a tent of sort. And he said, it's so interesting that you say that. Like this, I, I, this was my first time talking to this guy. He goes, it's so interesting you say that. This is the architect for the building. When I first came to see the site, there were these giant trees on the land. And they mm. had these huge canopies. That, that reached far and you could stand under them, these canopies, these beautiful canopies. And he says, so when I thought of the building, I thought of it as a canopy. And I was thinking like, oh my God, like, oh, I could do so much with that. Like the building, and if you come, when you come to this building, I was there the other day standing underneath the building. We just raised the last piece of steel um, and I'm standing underneath the building and I'm, I'm there with actually Karen Price and we're standing down and he was like, so what's going to go there? I was like, people, what's going to go there? People, because we're in this giant plaza. Mm. Incredible underneath this beautiful, beautiful canopy. And so when I think about a canopy, I think about places, places where people gather, they mm -hmm. find sanctuary back to our earlier point. Right. They find a sense of protection, commonplace. And you find that across the world, you know, whether it's a, a you know, a market in Haiti mm -hmm. or it's, you know, 
downtown LA, someone has a canopy to protect themselves from the elements. And so I just think it's such an incredible moment. Um, anyway, so. I love, I, I love that story. I love that story. I have a, a young, I have to read this from a CC uh, Pasadena student. He said, thank, his name is um, Christopher, I think Gonzalez, if I'm getting that correct. He says, thank you. I must take leave as a first year CC student. I enjoy the adventure through poetry, music, and cultural impact from an acceptable perspective this evening. So, Interesting. That's I've not heard that before. So thank you very much for that. Um, there are people who want to know how they can reach you. Um, here's another. Here's another comment. I do. It says thank you so much for the program. I'm so thrilled to hear about this Lucas Museum, which I want to be a part of that congregation. Thank you from Cheryl Box Smith. So your congregation is now growing. <laughs> People want to be a part of your congregation. So mm -hmm. I think that's a great note to end on. What I want to do is, is first of all, thank everyone out there. I, I didn't put a time limit on this. It was just, it was so much wonderful information that you gave this evening. I thank you for like just giving up all yourself and time. We'll have this to come back and look on when we rebroadcast this later. And I think it's going to be information that's not only going to help the institution at Pasadena City College, but I also think it's going to help the congregation that you're building to come so we can clap our hands in all these different ways, so to speak. So I wanna do this. I wanna go back to the 12 year old Sandra Jackson Dumont and say, looking back at your 12 year old self right now and where you are today, what would you tell people to inspire, encourage, or as I say, give them something proactive to deal with because we're in such this, um, this time frame of being in COVID-19. I had my first shot yesterday, by the way, and I'm doing well. Um, and people have all these different things, how they feel. But your 12-year-old self speaking to you now, what can you say to the people in the Zoom and something that they can take back to help them move forward? Um, two things one is that i grew up in a little theater program from um that was based on the tenants of sun ra um great jazz musician um it's called best children's theater in san francisco and my dance teacher is on space is the place like she like literally judith holton is vocals and dance and played on and performed on saturday night live mm. so what i would tell them from those early roots is that little shy girl who was you know very curious um, but shy, um, that the imagination is not like, it's not a luxury, it is actually a tool and a skill set. So I would say, use it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second thing I would say is that um, I think it's important to speak the truth and point to hope. Those two things have to be wrapped up with each other. So that's what I would say. Speak the truth. <laughs> You know, James Baldwin had a quote that said, um, you must go the way your blood beats. If you don't live the only life that you have, you won't live some other life. You won't live any life at all. Sandra mm -hmm. Jackson Dumont, you are living a life. <laughs> and um, I'm going to be a part of your congregation somehow. Don't know what oh. it is, but I'm here <laughs> for you when you say, Charles, come on around. So just know that. And I think most of the people here after hearing you today, they're ready for the congregation. So after COVID-19, when we get to whatever the other side is, we're ready to jump into that big old pool that you're building, so to speak. So I wanna say thank you on behalf of Pasadena City College, um, Dr. Christopher David West, my team that's been working with me putting this together, and a special thank you to your team, and especially Elizabeth and Riley, <laughs> um, oh, because I have been working with them for over a year. They kind of sort of really kept things moving, and I so appreciate you that after a, a whole year went by and we got this program done. So thank you for that, and I appreciate you, and all the best to you in the museum, and we'll see you around. Thank you so much. And I have to say thank you to these amazing, amazing ASL interpreters. I mean, that's, a, that's some next level interpretation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Charles, really, truly. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate you so much. Well, everyone, that was the great Sandra Jackson Dumont. And speaking of the ASL, 
um, folk, they're called Pro Bono ASL. You can reach them and find them. They're around. Um, you can go to their website, Pro Bono ASL. Rory Burton uh, has been so wonderful to be a part of this. We, we're glad that we can make sure we support the hearing impaired and those who are hard of hearing because that's also an audience space that needs to get information. I'm kind of full this evening, y'all. I'm really full. We will see you next week on March the 30th for Barry witness black animation phenomenon with our special guest academy award winner matthew a cherry here love i'm going to see you in the afterglow jam session with dj lene denise until then y'all let it be easy and continue to go where your blood beats cali girl but she's so New York, tattoos on her hand. She says it didn't hurt. She had a no hurry. Walking without worries. Downtown's hella busy. Traffic got me dizzy. We all want so much and have it last real long. Still return from missing things we've been wishing for. Wishing for make my own breeze, do my own thing. Call it like I see it. I call it like I see it. People pushing us aside, like legends we will ride.